482. Our song of encouragement, 482. When a preacher has been preaching, going through his lesson, and on a day such as today, when obviously there are plans with families and different things after the services, it gets to a point in the lesson where people get excited because the preacher usually says something along the, the lines of finally. I remember sitting through a lesson one time whenever a preacher said that and he preached for another 20 minutes. Just because you see a five-sentence sermon, don't think that I'm preaching a five-sentence sermon. This is a sermon about a five-sentence sermon, not a five-sentence sermon. This morning, I would turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10. In Acts chapter 10, we learn about a man whose name is Cornelius. Cornelius, it is said in verse 2 of, of that chapter, was a devout man and one who feared God with all his household, who gave alms generously to the people and prayed to God always. And it continues to talk about him sitting and, and praying and, and a vision comes. And an angel comes to Cornelius, stands in front of him and said, okay, here's what you need to do. I'm not going to get into them details. That's not what the sermon's about. But as we go on a little bit further in chapter 10, we read that Peter is also receiving a vision as he is on the rooftop, housetop, and, and the Lord sends him this vision. You remember the blanket that is let down with all kind of animals and God says to him, Peter, rise, kill and eat. And we have that vision repeated over and over. Well, what God is telling Peter is, at that moment, you need to open your mind a little bit. You know, the Jews had a, a view of the Gentile population. They viewed the Gentile population, by the way, which most of us are, as dogs. Literally. Worthless the lowest of the low. They would not, and we find out here in, in chapter 10 also, we find out, uh, I believe it's in verse 28, it says, Then he said to them, As Peter comes with Cornelius, you know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company with or go to another of another, one of another nation. And so what his point is, the Jews wouldn't even go in the house of a Gentile. And yet what the, what the Lord did was he sent these men from Cornelius to Peter so that Peter would understand that he needed to go with them. He sent that vision of the sheep. And so Peter goes with them, goes with these Gentile men back to where Cornelius is. And that's where we find our situation this morning. It says uh, that Peter was to tell him things by which he must be saved. And we don't learn that until you look over in chapter 11 whenever Peter is retelling this story there in verse 14. Cornelius is sent for him and he has said to Peter, God's told me that you'll tell me what he's commanded, verse 33. And so Peter is going to tell Cornelius what he needs to do to be saved. But not only him, but also there were many who were gathered around. There were many in the house that day. His household, but many others were gathered together. And so Peter has been given this opportunity by God to preach the gospel to Gentiles. First time it had ever happened. And what a wonderful day that would be. Can you imagine for a moment, think about 
those living in the world who they know about God and, and many of them believe in God. Many of them know that God exists and, and maybe a lot of them even believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God and yet they have never heard the gospel. That, I believe, is where we find Cornelius. He is a devout man. He is a praying man. He believes in God. And yet what Peter suggests here as he begins his sermon, and if you'll look with me in verse 36, I'll show you this. He suggests that they had already heard about Jesus. Notice what he says. The word which God sent to the children of Israel preaching peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all, that word you know, which was proclaimed throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism uh, which, was, which John preached. And so as Peter is introducing what he's getting ready to talk about, he is talking about something that they've already heard some about. And there are a lot of people in the world today that know a lot about God. They know a lot about Jesus, but they don't hear the gospel. And in the next five sentences, I say five sentences, I'm reading from the New King James Version, and in the New King James, it is five sentences. In other English Bibles, it may be split up differently. As a matter of fact, in the Greek, it is split up differently. But we're going to go with this as a five-sentence sermon because it is broken down into five separate points in each sentence. And as he goes through that, he tells the story of Jesus, the gospel, the good news. What it is that we all need to hear is good news. And so as we begin, we're going to begin looking, beginning in verse 38... At the first sentence, he talks about how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And so the first point we see here, we notice that God anointed Jesus. God was with Jesus. You see, the Gentiles needed to understand that God had sent him. He was not just another prophet. He was not just a great teacher. Maybe that's all they had heard about Jesus. He was just a man who was really good at what he does. And maybe that's what they knew. But they needed to understand he was more than just a prophet. He was anointed by God. That word anointed is a, is a very interesting word. It is from that word that we actually get Christ. Christ literally means the anointed one. And those who would hear that word anointed in that day and time would picture in their minds a king. One who has been anointed as king to be ruler. And so this is what Peter is describing Jesus to be to these Gentiles. He is a king. He is the ruler. Not only that, but God gave him power over the, over the evil spirits. He gave them power to, to heal, to do good. And then he ends that sentence with the, that very fact that God was with him. All of those things would be a big deal for a Gentile, especially God was with him. Now, it says that Cornelius was a man who feared God, and so he was not a pagan worshiper. But, you know, in the pagan world, whenever they worshiped their gods, small letter gods, they didn't ever believe that their gods was with them. What they tried to do is they tried to appease the gods so that by chance they, their god would not be against them. But there was never this idea in the pagan world that their God could be with them. This is a different God. And this is a different king anointed to be savior of the world. The world needs to understand who Jesus is. In Matthew chapter 3 and verse 17, Matthew wrote, And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. 
Jesus Christ had went to John to be baptized of John and when he came up out of the water and the, and the Spirit lit upon him like a dove, the heavens opened up and God proclaimed himself, this is my son. This is my son in whom I'm well pleased. He is the Savior who will take away the sins of the world. John chapter 1 verse 29, the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him. This is actually before he was baptized and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. If we want our sins to take it, be taken away, guess what? Jesus is the one to do it. He is the one. So whenever we talk about Jesus coming to the earth and doing good, there is no greater good that Jesus ever did than to make it possible for our sins to be taken away. He is anointed king of all the earth. In John chapter 18 and verse 37, whenever Jesus is brought before Pontius Pilate, Pilate asks him the question, are you a king then? Jesus said, you say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born and for this cause I have come into the world. He is the one who takes away sins and he is the one who is ruler. If we go back up to verse 36, notice that the, the little thing that Peter puts in that phrase, he is Lord of all. Jesus is Lord. He is our king. And God has exalted him so that every name should bow to him. Philippians chapter 2 verses 9 and 10 says, Therefore God has also highly exalted him and given him the name by which every, or excuse me, name above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth. There is no other king that we ought to pay homage to. There is over in, I believe it's in 2 Timothy, Paul talks about he is the blessed potentate. He is the sovereign, Lord of lords, king of kings. He is the one. He is not just a teacher. And so we, the world, all of us need to understand who Jesus is. And that's what Peter was doing in that first sentence. In the second sentence of his sermon, he said in verse 39, And we are witnesses of all things which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they killed by hanging on a tree. Isn't it interesting that the King of kings, Lord of lords, The man whom God was with was killed by the Jews. Jesus, the anointed one, was not just killed. He was crucified by the Jews. The most gruesome, humiliating death that man has ever devised, or at least in that time. I can't think of anything worse. It wasn't just that they killed him. They made a spectacle of him. Embarrassed him. Ashamed him. Peter and the apostles, they were witnesses. They were witnesses of everything that Jesus did. And they were witnesses of the crucifixion. Now think about what he says. He says, whom they killed. The Jews. But you know what? The Jews didn't kill Jesus. It was the Romans who crucified Jesus on the cross. But you see what Peter is saying here? They would have known that. The Gentiles would have heard this story. How the Romans were the ones who hung him up on that cross. The Romans were the ones who beat him within an inch of his life. The Romans were the ones who made him carry that cross so far before handing it over to someone else. The Romans were the ones who did that. Why did he say the Jews killed him? Because it was the Jews who caused it to happen. The world has killed Jesus. 
The world has killed Jesus. How do I mean? Jesus came because of the sins of the world. In 1 John chapter 2 and verse 2, John wrote, And he himself is the propitiation, the stand-in sacrifice for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. That's why Jesus was sent. Jesus was sent to live so that he could die for you and me. It is our sins that crucified Jesus. In Romans chapter 5 and verse 8, Paul wrote, But God demonstrates his own love toward us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Even though we are the problem, Jesus, innocent blood, died for us. We need to understand that it is our sins that sent Jesus to the cross. There we go. In verses 40 and 41, we have the next sentence of Peter's sermon. He said, Him God raised up on the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but to witnesses chosen before God before by God, even to us who ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead. You see, the resurrection, the resurrection is a key point in this sermon. Did the Jews kill him? Yes. Did the Romans kill him? Yes. Did we put him on that cross? You most certain we, we did. But that wasn't the end. Peter said it was not a secret resurrection, but it was done openly. It was known. Also, even in that verse, look at that, what he says. Even to us who ate and drank with him after he arose. It wasn't just an apparition. It wasn't their imaginations, you know, one of those mass hallucination things. It wasn't any of that. Jesus Christ was there with him after he rose from the dead. Without the resurrection, there, there really is no point. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. Now the whole chapter is Paul talking about the resurrection and why it's important. I just want to notice a couple of key things as we look at that chapter. First of all, I want us to notice, beginning in verse 3, he lists those witnesses who saw Jesus risen from the dead. He said, For I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the Scripture, and that he was seen by Cephas, then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep. After that, he was seen by James, then by all the apostles. Then, last of all, he was seen by me also, as by one born out of due time. And so Paul is talking about all of these witnesses that actually saw Jesus Christ. And did you notice what he said about those witnesses? When Paul wrote this letter, when Paul wrote those words, a lot of those witnesses were still alive. Why is that important? It is important because if Paul just wrote this letter and wrote those words, anybody reading that could say, eh, I don't believe it actually happened. I know it's what he said, but I don't believe it actually happened. And you know, as people do today, whenever there are scientific papers written and, and different things, different evidences are brought forth, you know, their peers will, will judge those writings to see whether those things are actually so. Paul has given them the, the readiness, if they wanted to refute anything that he said, all they had to do is go prove that nobody witnessed this. But he said they're still living. And so they had that opportunity to go ask those people, did you see it happen? Yes, I did. 
He actually, he actually appeared to us in a room with a closed door. We handled him. That's what 1 John chapter 1, you read through that. John talks about we handled him. He was real. He was alive. And many of those witnesses were still living at that time. If we go further on down in chapter 15, look at verses uh, 17 and 19. It says, and if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. And then he says in 19, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most pitiable, most miserable, the King James says. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is our hope. Because if Jesus didn't raise, and that's what he's talking about, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, or if there is no resurrection, Jesus didn't rise from the dead, and then we're, we're lost. We're lost in our sins. Well, the opposite of that works as well. If Jesus didn't raise from the dead, then we're not going to be raised either. But he did rise. He did come up out of that grave. In 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3, Peter wrote, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope, notice, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That is how we have hope. Because Jesus did raise from the dead. And that's what Peter needed those Gentiles to understand. Trust in the hope of the resurrection. As he continues his sermon in verse 42, he says, And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is, or testify that it is he, I'll get it right in a minute, it is he who ordained, was ordained by God to be judge of the living and the dead. Notice what he says there, Jesus is judge of the living and the dead. Now I realize that, you know, that was written a long time ago and the word there is was ordained by God to be judge. But if you go back and you look at the Greek and you, and you learn to understand those tenses of those verbs, this one is a perfect tense verb. And what a perfect tense verb means is it was true then and it continues to be true now. That's what that's talking about. He wasn't judge of the living and dead then and now, you know, we're okay. No, he is now today judge of the living and the dead. The Father has given all judgment to him. Look at John 5. Look in John 5, verses 22 through 27. John 5, beginning in verse 22. For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son, that all should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the, honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who he sent, who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Most assuredly, I say to you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. And as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself and has given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the Son of God. Jesus Christ is now today our judge. All will be judged Notice, according to his gospel. In Romans chapter 2 and verse 16, Paul said, In the day when God will judge the secrets of men by Christ Jesus according to my gospel. There is the standard. You know, whenever you stand before a judge in a court, they have a standard that they go by, that they judge by. It is the laws of the land. It is the laws that pertain to the specific case that is going on. Well, God has given us his standard. He's given us his gospel. 
And we are going to be judged according to what is written in his gospel. You know what? You're not going to be judged by me. I'm not going to be judged by you. You're going to be in, among family, a lot of you today. Guess what? You're not going to be judged by your family. Your family's not going to be judged by you. We are each and every one of us going to be judged by the king, the one who is anointed over all. He is our judge. And all will be judged according to what he has done, whether it is in accordance with the gospel. In Matthew chapter 16, beginning in verse 26, it says, For what profit is it to, the, to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward each according to his works. We're going to be judged according to the things that we do in this life. The deeds done in the body, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10. It's according to what we've done. And you need to realize that you will be judged by those things. And then the final sentence in his sermon. I can see that. Put that final in there so you get y'all excited. He said to him, all the prophets witness that through his name, whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins. It is through Jesus' name that remission is given to those who believe. Turn with me to Jeremiah 31. Jeremiah 31. Peter said that the prophets witnessed to this. The prophets have foretold these things. The prophets are declaring these things. In Jeremiah chapter 31, beginning in verse 33... Jeremiah wrote, but this is the covenant that I, God, will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. Notice for I will forgive their iniquity and their sins I will remember no more. It is through the name of Jesus Christ. That's who he's talking about here. That our sins will be taken away. These Gentiles, before they could be saved, they had to hear the word of God. They had to hear the gospel, the good news. They had to hear what it was that Je or who Jesus was. They had to hear what Jesus came to do. They had to hear about his death and his burial and his resurrection. They had to hear that he is now our judge and the one who will judge us according to what we do in this life. They needed to hear that so that they could believe it. And through belief, they could have remission of sins. But you know, if you leave it right there, you miss out on all that Peter talked about. Did he preach that sermon in five sentences? Yes, he did. And he told the story of Jesus, did he not? He told it. What we have here is something that people like to use to prove that all we have to do is believe. Look with me in the text, going back to Acts chapter 10. It says in verse 46, While he was still talking to the multitudes, behold, his mother and brothers... I'm in the wrong place. <laughs> That was from class this morning. Let me get to where we're supposed to be. Acts chapter 10. Let me tell you the right verse too. Verse 44. Okay, we all together? I'm here with you now, I promise. 
While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word. And those of the circumcision who believed were astonished as many as came with Peter because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then Peter answered, we'll get to that in a minute. Do you see what happened whenever Peter preached to these Gentiles? The Holy Spirit filled them. And the world has taken that passage and they've said, See, all you have to do is believe. The Holy Spirit filled them. Surely that means they're saved, right? It don't. How do I know? I know because Peter... In chapter 11, look with me. I'm trying to find the exact verse 4. But Peter explained it to them in order from the beginning. Do you see that? That's important. Peter explained the events that happened to the rest of the Jews. He explained it in the proper order. And we have him talking about the vision and he's talking about going to Cornelius and Cornelius telling Peter, you know, that you, you're supposed to come and tell me, verse 14, you'll tell me words by which you and your household will be saved. Okay? In verse 15, Peter said, And I, as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them as upon us at the beginning. Pay attention. Peter was supposed to preach them words by which they were to be saved. The Holy Spirit fell upon these Gentiles as Peter began to speak, not as he finished speaking. The Holy Spirit fell on these Gentiles before they ever heard the words by which they must be saved. So I know that the Holy Spirit did not save those people at that moment. It's not possible. It doesn't fit in the order of things. But notice what he says in verse 15. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them as upon us at the beginning. That is the key phrase right there. On the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit came down and filled the apostles. And they began to preach the first gospel sermon. And here Peter is saying, just like it happened to us on that day, that important day, now it has happened to the Gentiles. Why do you think maybe that's the case? Because before this point, they only preached the gospel to the Jews. And God needed them to understand it is open now for the Gentiles. Go preach to the Gentiles. And so God made it known they needed the word too. Now let's go back to chapter 10. Verse 46 again. They heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then Peter answered, Can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. I lied. It wasn't a five-sentence sermon. It was six. It was six sentences. We live in a world who really wants to ignore having to do anything different in my life To be saved by a Savior that was sent to die for me. 
He paid the price for our sins. What do you mean I have to do something in order to get that? Well, you've got to do something because, first of all, he is king. God made him king. We've got to do something because it is he who rose from the dead to give us a hope of resurrection. We've got to do something because he is appointed as judge over our lives. And he's going to judge it according to the gospel, the New Testament, as Christ has sent to us to live by. He commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. It is in the name of the Lord where we find salvation. I'm going to go through these verses very quickly. John 8 and verse 24. Jesus said, Therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins, for if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. How true is that? Nobody would think that you can't... You know, you got to believe. Nobody disagrees with that. you got to believe. Obedience, turn with me to John chapter 3. You know John chapter 3 and verse 16. I'm going to read a couple other verses with you along with that. John 3, 16, he says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved, through his name. Verse 18. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. There is more to being saved from our sins than just believing. But if you don't start with believe, there is no hope for any of the rest of it doing you any good. Jesus said in Luke chapter 13 and verse 3, unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. And so we've got to repent. What does that repentance mean? It means we need to change our minds, which leads to a change of life. We cannot live in sin anymore and expect Jesus to save us. It's not going to happen. It is not. He gave us his gospel by which we are going to be judged. And if we don't live according to that, he's going to judge us accordingly. In Mark chapter 16, verse 16, Jesus said, He who believes and is baptized will be saved. That ought to be so plain. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. The word and is a coordinating conjunction. It takes two things and it puts them together and places them on equal footing. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. You can't leave out either one and be saved. Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 9, the Hebrews writer said about Jesus, having, having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Obey him. Obey him. Believe. And obey the gospel. And you too can be saved from your sins. Peter's sermon was short. Mine was not. But that's okay. Peter's sermon was short but it was to the point. God sent Jesus Christ into the world to save it from sin. We're a part of that. We're a part of that world. The Jews rejected him and had him crucified. Guess what? We're guilty of that. You and me, we're guilty of that. God raised him from the grave. And there is hope because we can experience that. God made him judge of all. 
We're the all. We're part of the all. We are accountable to that. It is in his name that forgiveness is given. And we can have that. We can have that forgiveness. This evening, Lord willing, and I hope that, that many of you can come back this evening, I'm going to preach one of my uncle's sheet sermons. And it's a sermon about baptism. What baptism can and cannot do for you. From the scriptures, exactly what scripture says. I hope you come back and you hear that. Or maybe you'll look back on it online and, and see that as well. It is in the name of Christ that we must be saved. So believe. That's what he said in John 3, 3 16. Believe. John 8, verse 24. Believe. Repent of your sins. Acts chapter 17 and verse 30. He says, you know, the time of this ignorance God winked at, but now he commands all men everywhere to repent. And that's what we've got to do. We've got to change our minds about sin and live for him. Stop living in this world. We need to confess him as our Lord, as our King. Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. And then we must be baptized into his name. John 3, verse 5, you know, right, right back up before that John 3, 16 verse that everybody wants to harp on. In John 3 and verse 5, he says, Unless you are born again of water and spirit, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. We have to be baptized to enter the kingdom of heaven. Acts chapter 2, 38, he said it is at baptism that is for remission of sins. It brings remission of sins. And there are those today who will even try to twist that. And they'll say it's because of remission of sins. That is not possible when you go back and you look at a verse over in Matthew when he says he shed his blood for the remission of sins. It's the same phrase. You telling me that he shed his blood because we already had remission of sins? That doesn't make sense. We are baptized so that we will gain remission of sins. Galatians chapter 3, 27 says, As many of you as were baptized have put on Christ. How do we get in Christ? Where the blessings are, Ephesians chapter 1, 3. We do it through baptism. 1 Peter 3 and verse 21 is one of those most ungetaroundable verses that's in the Bible. In the King James Version, he says, Baptism doth now also save us. Do you want to be saved from your sins this morning? Then obey the gospel. The gospel is the form of what Jesus went through. He died and was buried and he rose again. Romans chapter 6 says that's what we do in baptism. You die to your old man of sins, you are buried with him in water, and you rise to walk a new life. And I would invite you this morning, if you haven't done that, do that today. Otherwise, the hope, the resurrection that Jesus gave us is not a hope for you. You don't have that hope unless you obey him. I know I've gone long this morning. I know it was not a short sermon. But I'm talking about you being saved. That's important. And if you don't know how important that is, please get with me or one of these other men and let us sit down and study with you and, and help you see from Scripture why it is so important to do these things. This isn't, these are not my words. These are God's words. It's not my gospel. It's His gospel. He's the King. If you haven't obeyed the gospel, please consider doing that this morning. Don't put it off. If you have obeyed the gospel this morning, but there are things in your life that has pulled you away from God, can we help you to come back? Is there something we can do for you to help you be in a right relationship with God today? If so, if we can help you in any way, please come forward.